Good evening. If you will please start taking your seats, we'll begin in just a minute. I see people still walking in, so we'll just give them one more minute, and then we'll begin right on time. Okay, thank you all so much for joining us this evening. I'd like to welcome everyone here to Sacred Heart of Jesus in Broussard in our beautiful Parish Life Center. And I'd also like to welcome everyone who's watching online. Can you hear me? Is the mic good? Is everything good? Okay, thank you. Okay, I'd like to invite Father Michael, our pastor, up to open us in prayer. We pray in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Loving Father, thank you so much for the gift of your church, uh, the Bride of Christ, and for giving us this year of the Eucharist to focus on the true presence of Jesus and the most holy sacrament. We pray for a renewal in the church of belief and hope, and we pray for a renewal in our own hearts that we may see the beautiful gift that Jesus has given us in his body and blood, soul, and divinity. Holy Spirit, come upon this night in our conversation. May the topic we talk about not only influence our minds, but stir our hearts into a deeper love of you, Jesus. Make your presence known here tonight. All those who are here present, all those who watch. Mother Mary, come and be with us as you did with your son. Come and encourage all those who listen to his words through our mouths. Come and pray for us and protect us with your prayer. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, good evening again, and um, just to let everyone know that we have provided a handout again today. We, we ordinarily do this for you. This one, uh, for those of you online and for those of you who are here who want to access it online, we have numerous links in the back to papal documents, encyclicals, videos by Bishop Barron, um, various videos and um, documents, and so please take advantage of this. This is for you to do continuous and continual and advanced research and um, prayer, and so um, this is for you. We're not going to follow this specifically tonight, but it has a lot of great references and information for you. And so to welcome you tonight, my name is Chris DeBio. I'm a parishioner here at Sacred Heart, and I've been part of the formation team for a few years, and we have a guest with us tonight from the community of Jesus Crucified, a religious priest, Father John Joseph. So welcome, Father. Thank you so much. <laughs> Father Champagne always said that uh, an expert is, is someone from out of town with a briefcase. So <laughs> I came from St. Martinville, and I brought my briefcase. <laughs> <laughs> And so for those of you who have seen um, Father John Joseph with us before, you know that this is going to be a treat. And for those of the, you who have not, um, get ready. It's going to be amazing. So tonight I want to talk about, well, we're going to be talking about the real presence. And I wanted to kind of frame up and, and talk to you about how we came to this. 
So one of my favorite books by Bishop Barron was put out, um, I think it's a reprint. It was put out in 2021 by Word on Fire, and it's called Eucharist. And in this small, it's like a theological treatise, but he talks about the Eucharist as a sacred meal. He talks about it as a sacrifice, and he talks about the Eucharist in the real presence. And um, in chapter 3, he talks about one of his favorite authors, Flannery O'Connor, who he says is one of the best 20th century uh, Catholic authors. And he talks about how she was at a, a dinner party, and one of her friends approached her, trying to engage her in the conversation with the other colleagues, and said, I just think it's so beautiful that the Eucharist is such a great and powerful symbol of Christ. And Flannery O'Connor's very famous response was, well, if it's a symbol, to hell with it. <laughs> and I was kind of shocked when I heard that. But this is the same belief and the same um, conviction that the Catholic Church has had from the beginning of time. And so tonight, we've invited Father John Joseph to really help us unpack scripture, tradition, um, our church fathers, and what the church has said about the real presence. And we're going to talk about all kinds of things tonight. We should finish right around 7, but if we can finish earlier, we will open the floor up to questions and answers. So please um, text in your, your questions if you have some. If not, raise your hands. We, we want to get everyone involved. So, Father, can you start us out with ancient church like what have we always thought where does that come from and and tell us how this all began yeah sure I, and you know just just a comment too real briefly on Flannery O'Connor's statement and and just the situation that we found ourselves in so recently the diocese of Lafayette sent to the priest an email talking about the numbers of attendance at church and so it had 2018, 2019, uh, 2020 was unavailable. And then, uh, but then, you know, it eventually gets to 2022. In October of 2022, well, in, in October of 2018, there were 50, uh, sorry, there were 71,000 people attending mass in the Diocese of Lafayette. 71, they counted 71,000. The same month in 2022, 54,000. That's 17,000 people who stopped going to Mass over the course of COVID. Now, that's not just because of the situation with uh, COVID, and I mean, certainly people, we've lost some lives, but not that many, which tells us that majority of our people who are going to Mass believe that the Eucharist is just symbolic of our faith. And, and so they say with Flannery O'Connor, to hell with it. And uh, are, are not returning to the sacrament of God's presence among us. And that's why the bishops the U United States bishops called for a Eucharistic revival because they saw the, the waning of our Eucharistic faith. And it's certainly something that's wrenching the heart of Christ because it's the greatest gift that he has given to us. But, but to start off, to, to answer your question, uh, that why, where do we start with the with Old Testament and where does this Eucharistic faith come from? Well, it really, I mean, we see, we see, writ, we see a sort of allusions to it, pointing to it in the Old Testament as early, as early as the Jewish tradition. We see the Passover, that they were to take unleavened bread. And the reason why it was unleavened is because they were hurrying up and taking off to go uh, to, to, to flee. Um, and then the most prominent presence that we we see uh, or pointing to the Eucharist is the manna. And the manna, as you, uh, uh, I don't know if you know what manna means. You know what manna means? Remember that? 
the pop quiz <laughs> on uh, it, quiz. <laughs> yeah, Hebrew. It's it's Hebrew for what is it? <laughs> so uh, so you got it right, Miss Krista. <laughs> uh, so it, it literally means what is it, bread? There was a sense in which they knew that God was was giving something special, but they didn't know what it was. And so it really was, in a sense, God's presence, but they didn't really understand it. And this, uh, I think this is extremely important because they start to reserve the manna in the, in the tabernacle, in the tent. That's what tabernacle means. It's a tent. And they would reserve the manna because they called it the bread of the presence. So this is an this is an ancient ancient Judaism that we see this understanding that God is somehow mysteriously present with this bread, even though they don't know what it is. And then, you know, you you see the that bread is very much a symbol for wisdom, for truth in and throughout the Old Testament scriptures. That, you know, you eat you eat the bread of wisdom. It's it's something substantial. It sustains you. It gives you, uh, it fills you. And then, of course, we see Christ taking bread, breaking it. He take, he blessed, he broke, and then he gave. And then it multiplies the bread. And we see that, that happening as well. Well, whenever he does that, um, the multiplication of the loaves, people are filled, they're satisfied. And so they search him out again. And then in searching him out, this is where we get the famous bread of life discourse which is in John chapter 6 John chapter 6 Jesus begins by saying you're not looking for me because you want to know because you, you really want truth you really want what I have to give you you're looking for me because I filled your belly and you want to see me do some more magic tricks and, and that is, is he, he challenges them and then they say, well, what are you saying? And he says, well, my father gives you the true bread from heaven. And then they say, are you supposed to be greater than Moses who gave his bread? He goes, no, 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 Moses didn't give you that bread. Don't forget, it was my father who gave you the bread. Moses pointed to it, but my father was the one who gave you the bread. And then they say, well, what? Then they, they, it begs the question, well, what is it? What is it? Manna, what is it? And he says, I am the bread of life. That, he, by that statement, he's indicating his presence in the flesh is what God gives us to satisfy our souls. In and through his incarnation, that his body, that he became one of us. He had to deal with the, thing, the mess of being a human being. He had fingernails and earwax and everything that it means to be human. He came and satisfied the deepest longings of our, of our human nature. And when he goes on and he describes in detail what this bread, he says, my flesh I will give you for the life of the world. So now he's talking, he's transitioning to his crucifixion. He's talking about his incarnation. I am the bread come down from heaven. His, his crucifixion, my flesh I will give for the life of the world. And then finally he says, and my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. At that point, it's undeniable what he's talking about there. There he's talking about the Eucharist. He wouldn't have said true food. He would have said my, my flesh is kind of like food. Or the kingdom of heaven is like the kingdom of heaven is like. My flesh is like? No. My flesh is true food. In other words, you will eat my flesh and drink my blood. And unless you do, there will be no life in you. That's what Jesus says in that sixth chapter of John. And the people challenged him. Yes. The people said, how can he say this? I mean, to the Old Testament, to the Jewish people, that would have sounded not only totally theologically 
inaccurate because it was against the law to eat meat with blood in it. Yep. But it would have sounded totally irrational. And so the people challenged him. And Jesus, in other times, clarified, like to Nicodemus, he clarified. Yes. You, you don't go back into your mother's womb. But in this case, he doubles down. And right. he says, amen, amen, I say to you. Mm-hmm. And so, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, no, that's exactly, that's exactly right. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't say, oh, wait, okay, all right, all right, look, I'll make it a little bit easier for y'all. He doesn't, he doesn't soften it. I mean, imagine, imagine if I, like, this is the question that was asked throughout the whole Old Testament. What is it? What is this bread? And Jesus stands up and he says, it's me. Okay? Now, I mean, imagine if I, like, just talking to y'all made a claim like that. Of course you would say, Whoa, buddy! <laughs> All right, well, we know you're you're out of town and with a briefcase, but don't go making <laughs> claims like that. That have been going too far. So you see what Jesus is doing, and then and then as as Miss Krista said, he's he's not only doing that, but he's breaking laws. He's challenging Jewish tradition. He's going a step further, and it's that radical. And then the famous verse of John six six six, kind of spooky, huh? John 666, let me see if I can find it real quick. Give me a second. Oops. Um, the famous verse where they do decide that they're not going to, that Jesus says, they say, how can we follow this? And then it says, after this, many of his disciples drew back and no longer walked with him. 17,000 in our diocese. No longer walked with him. Because his saying was so difficult. Because it requires pure faith. And it certainly challenges us. But the Eucharist is the gift. The gift that God gives us. And so that's why we we make that act of faith in him. So we believe that the body and blood of Jesus Christ are really truly and substantially present in the consecrated host in the Eucharist. And so how does that happen? Talk to us about transubstantiation. Like what does that mean? And for our Protestant brothers and sisters that sometimes challenge our belief in um, transubstantiation, explain that to us because this isn't something that we get to not believe. As Catholics, we can't say, oh, well, I believe in everything else, but I really, I really believe it's just a symbol. We can't do that. And so can you help us with that? Yeah. So I'll, I'm going to just kind of tell a little anecdote, a little story about myself. And uh, I'll tell this story pretty often. And I, I think I believe you all are going to have another formation night regarding the Eucharistic miracles. But transubstantiation... So this is something you got to know in the church is we oftentimes make up words to describe realities that we, we've never experienced before. So, but like I said, you know, I was thinking about this. If, if it was never challenged that Jesus, let's say we, somebody all of a sudden stood up and said, no, Jesus wasn't nailed to the cross like this. He had his arms tied up in a vertical position. Okay, well, that's never been said, you know. But if someone were to say that, then the church would come back and say, no, he was, he was crucified such and such a way. You know, it, it, it's not necessary because everybody believes it, you see. It was the same thing about Eucharistic faith that was present in the scriptures, present in the, the early church. They already believed this. It wasn't until it was challenged that you have to start making words and try to describe the reality that's happening. So in this case, that word is transubstantiation, which means trans to change, like transport or whatever. (laughs) Alcatrans. I'm not going to get all the different kinds of trans, but anyway. (laughs) But trans to go from this to that, and it's saying the substance changes, which means that it's not the appearance it's not what it looks like, tastes like, smells like, but what it is, what is it, what it is changes. And so the substance changes. As St. Thomas Aquinas says, you know, seeing, touching, tasting, I, I do not now perceive. But 
what I've been taught by faith, I believe. And so the substance changes. It's not a physical appearance, but it's the reality that's changing. Well, this, this is, like I said, uh, was something very significant for me because my whole life growing up, uh, you can, my mom and my sister are here, they can tell you, I always wanted to be a cardiovascular surgeon when I was, from when I was very little, or a heart doctor when I was little, little. But as, as time went on, well, you know, lo and behold, that's not what God had planned for me. And that was a dream that I had to give up. But then there was a, a friend of mine, well, and I actually got to see open heart surgery and watch it, and I, I said, when I saw someone's beating heart, I said to myself, if I could hold one person's heart in my hands like that, my life would be complete. And so whenever I would dis, I discerned the priesthood and I, I realized I was going to have to give up that dream along with, of course, giving up a wife and a family and, and those sorts of things. Well, whenever I read a book on what's called transubstantiation miracles, which means that every transubstantiation is a miracle because it changes substance, but not every time does it physically change. In fact, very seldom does it. But there are instances where that's happened, and when it does, it always changes into heart flesh. The scientists have studied it's inexplicable. It's always living heart tissue. And that's when I realized that the one person's heart I was supposed to hold was his. But that's, that, that reality of the change of substance is so powerful for me because it's the only thing that makes sense of our life as priests. It really does. It's the only thing. You know, and that's why, that's why, you know, priests can either be, you know, sort of cute little figures that you, you're like, oh, yeah, when I need to, you know, just kind of feel good, I, uh, I'll go to a priest, maybe. Or priests are the ones that are actually feeding us with Jesus. It's a major difference. And people are leaving the church because there's better preachers elsewhere. And that's, that is a, is a, is a shame. Because sometimes I'm good at preaching, sometimes I'm not. But every time I say those words, Jesus comes. And that's why we, that's why we remain in the church. So tell us about those words. Tell us about the words of institution. Tell us about when the Eucharist becomes the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus. Tell us a little bit about that. So, so the moment of consecration, the most important moment of the Mass, is, is when the priest says the words, this is my body, this is my blood. He's, and he's speaking in persona Christi, which means in the person of Christ. So, and we're very careful about doing that. So for, for instance, you know, like the demons and stuff like that, you know, you don't, you don't speak to them in the person of Christ unless you have the authority to do that. Uh, any of y'all saw uh, The Chosen? Um, so in The Chosen, um, there's, a, there's a great scene where Jesus gives the, the disciples, the apostles, the power to do certain things. And he, he says, uh, I mean, it's a great, I love this situation because he looks at him and he says, um, he says, so I'm giving you the authority to heal people and cast out demons. And they're like, What? And he's like, yeah, I'm, I'm giving you that authority. And then they say, uh, well, I don't feel any different. <laughs> it pretty much captures, you know. Um, and then, and then in the next episode, they have, you know, Matthew, who's, who's so nervous. And, and he's looking at that demon. And he's like, out, out. <laughs> you know, and, and the demon comes out. Because he has the authority to do that. He has the authority to speak in persona Christi. Uh, he's speaking, it's not his authority, it's not Matthew's authority, it's Christ's authority. And so, in the Mass, as well as in confession, I have the power, given to me by the bishop, to be able to use those words to change bread from bread into his body, wine into his blood, to forgive sins. I didn't have that power before I was a priest. Because I wasn't speaking in the person of Christ and in that authority, and so that's the, those are the that's the recipe for the Eucharist. 
person with that authority, a priest or a bishop, bread and wine, and then those words, the words that Christ gave us, uh, the words, or what are called the words of institution, where he instituted the Eucharist. So that's why when I say this is my body, it's Christ's body, because I'm speaking in his person. So if someone says to you, so Father, like you're eating Jesus, the person's flesh, how would you explain to them that it's the divine person, but it's the glorified Christ? Like how do you explain to people who challenge, like is it a cannibalistic faith? Is it, what, how, do you, how do you explain that? Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's really interesting to see in the early church how they had this kind of like back and forth. Because you get Ignatius of Antioch where he says, I've got, got a few quotes from him. He's very strong about it. He's like, I am God's wheat. I am ground by the teeth of the wild beast that I might end up as pure bread of Christ. So you have Ignatius of Antioch who's talking about his martyrdom as being a participation in the Eucharist. Because he's literally going to be eaten by wild beasts because they're going to throw him to the beasts. And so he's saying, I will be ground by a wild beast. So like wheat, I'll be ground so that I can become bread, united to the Eucharist. Powerful words. And Ignatius of Antioch, I mean, he goes on. This is, he, he says lots of other things, but he's very firm about eating the flesh of Jesus. But then you have Justin Martyr, who is like, look, we're not cannibals. There, it's it's through sign and through symbol. So that, that's always, it, it's, it's a tension there. Because what we're saying is that, is the Eucharist a symbol? Yes, but it's not just a symbol. So I always like to, a lot of times what I'll do is, I'll put the word tiger. So uh, like, just listen to me say the word tiger. None of y'all are running, screaming for the door because there's not an actual tiger in here. But there's a tiger in your mind now because I, I just communicated that word to you. And so now everybody has a tiger in their mind. So that, and, and listen, the, the word tiger in no way is similar to the actual feline jungle animal cat with stripes. Or Mike. <laughs> Mike the tiger. It's, it's in no way connected to that, but we've made that connection. But there's a difference between that word, the word tiger, and the word word. Is the word word a word? Yes. The word tiger is not a tiger. But the word word is a word. What, what I mean by that is what we call, it's called an efficacious symbol. In other words... It is what it signifies. It is what it points to. It points to itself in a certain way. Well, that's how it works with the Eucharist. So the Eucharist is a sign. It is symbolic. And it points to the reality that it is. So, so yeah, no, I mean, I'm not... Jesus doesn't say, ouch, whenever we consume the Eucharist. Okay? It's because he's... he's it was, it's through the sacra it's sacramentally given to us. His presence is given to us through the sacrament and yet in its reality. And as Ms. Krista said, it's his glorified body. So this is really interesting to me. But whenever we receive the Eucharist, uh, we receive his body, blood, soul, and divinity. Now on Holy Saturday, let's say St. John decided to celebrate Mass on Holy Saturday, which he probably didn't okay but holy saturday the first holy saturday well jesus's body was in the tomb his blood was on calvary his soul was in sheol okay and his divinity was at the right hand of the father so if we would have received the eucharist on holy saturday we would have just received his body because now that he's resurrected and his body, blood, soul, and divinity are united, whenever we receive even the fr a fragment of his body, we're receiving the whole Christ. That's called concomitance. Just, you know, if you want to drop that at a party next time. You know. so. If they want to sound really cool. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, 
I want to bring us back. Uh, this quote from St. Ignatius, they keep away from the Eucharist and from prayer because they do not confess that the Eucharist is the flesh of our Redeemer Jesus Christ who suffered for our sin and whom the Father and his goodness raised from the dead. I don't know if that's St. Paul or St. Ignatius. Okay, good. But St. Ignatius said that. And so we talked about the Old Testament and we talked about how from the beginning. Now, St. Ignatius died around 107. Yeah. So the early church fathers, so these are the men who knew the apostles, who, who were just right after Christ's death, walking around and preaching and in the new church. Tell us about um, that, and then tell us about how St. Paul testifies again to the fact that it's, it's real, that, that they believed from the beginning that Jesus and his flesh and blood it was it was it was real yeah no that uh, that's one of my favorite questions because especially saint ignatius so just to give you an idea whether or not this is true i don't know but it it's kind of cool so it was believed in tradition some traditions believe that ignatius of antioch this is not ignatius of loyola you know the jesuit not him this is ignatius of antioch ignatius of antioch it was believed that he may have been the child that Jesus said, let the little children come to me and welcome the child, because that's about the age he would have been whenever Jesus was preaching and teaching, etc. So it gives, I say that to put things in perspective. I don't know if that's true or not, but it's kind of cool to think. But Ignatius, that's how close Ignatius was. He wasn't, um, he wasn't one of the apostles, but he was very close to that Christ mystery. Now, to quote John Henry Newman, who is an, a convert from Anglicanism uh, into Catholicism, he said, he said, to learn history is to cease to be Protestant. That's what he said. That's what he in, experienced in his own life. To learn Ignatius of Antioch is to cease to be Protestant. And I say that with utter confidence because when you read St. Ignatius of Antioch, it is utterly clear what he believes the Eucharist to be. And this is 107. So remember, this is like Jesus died somewhere around 33 AD. Like, uh, I went to the nursing home today. There was a lady there who was 105 years old. And another man told me his birthday's next week. He's 103. And so I started thinking, what has this person seen? You know, like World War II, the Great Depression, you know, all kind of stuff. And so, but that, uh, the, just to put, you know, the lifetime experience, how close Ignatius would have been to Christ, to the apostles, probably knew a few of them. There seems to be some, some profound relationships between Ignatius and St. John and his gospel. And then, uh, and then you, you go on, and, and more and more the church fathers... St. Ignatius is really the bridge between the scriptures and the church fathers. And so when you get into the church fathers, you see again this faith developing, this faith, this understanding that, that the Eucharist is reality. And St. Augustine, he's unpacking the same thing. But again, like I said, you can't expect the scriptures to talk about issues that we're dealing with in 2022. You know, I mean, the scriptures don't talk about COVID, for instance, or, you know. But they, so, but they do talk about this mystery of the Eucharist, which for them was obvious. So if we really believe that Jesus is truly present in the Eucharist, then our natural response should be to bow down and adore him. And so talk to us about why we adore the Eucharist, you know, a little bit more, and how we best adore the Eucharist. Yeah, so, so one thing in, in St. John's Gospel, it's very clear that to see is to believe. Like, th that seeing comes through sight. So I'm going to tell you all a little story. Because when I was back at seminary, um, I wanted to get more Eucharistic adoration. So I was the guy that was aggravating everybody because I wanted to get more, more prayer time, you know. But um, so I said... I, I brought it to what was called the Spiritual Life Council or whatever. And um, I, I said, you know, I think we, sh we should be adoring 
you know, I wanted nocturnal hours. I wanted during the night. So that's why no, that's why everybody's aggravated with me. But um, but so I, I I brought this up, and someone said there's no difference between Jesus in the tabernacle and Jesus exposed. And um, and I was like, well, there's a difference for me. I mean, I can see him, you know. I, I think that's a difference. And so anyway, it, it kind of went around and nobody really st stood up for me. The next day, uh, this old priest from Boston who was on that council, he didn't say anything at the meeting, but he said, uh, he said, he said, Man, they uh, they really had something against you, huh? And I said, yeah, they did. He goes, all right, keep it up. <laughs> you know? <laughs> it's kind of, um, but anyway, one of the scripture guys on the council, what he said, how he responded to it is he said, you know, I think it's very Johannine, in other words, very according to John, to see Christ does something to us. And so to see the Eucharist does something to us. I knew a woman who she was atheist to the core. She had just gone through a bad breakup, rough situation. Her cousin kept inviting her to Eucharistic adoration. She kept saying no over and over and over and over and over and over again. Then finally... She said, just to get her to stop annoying me, I'm going to go. And so she went to the chapel, and they, you know, they, she punched in the code, and she's like, oh, gosh, they got it all locked up. You know, I mean, she was making fun of it in her mind. She said, as soon as she saw the Eucharist, she knelt down and wept for an hour. And I said, what happened? She said, I knew. I knew it was him. She just had to see. And that's very, you know, that's what Jesus invites the apostles. Come and see. Come and see. And come again. Keep coming and seeing. And so seeing him is an act of adoration. Because adoration is a creature going before the creator. That's what adoration is. That's what the catechism defines it as. So just going before the Eucharist and acknowledging him as creator is an act of adoration. Now, of course, we have to, it's not because God needs this, but because we need this. We need to genuflect. We need to bow. We need to, to do certain physical signs to express devotion and prayer. If we're not doing those things, if we're, you know, then... It, it's, it, it shows a lack of devotion on our part. And it shows that we don't, we don't want to manifest in our bodies as humans how, how we ought to love. I mean, it's just, I mean, we know there's just certain things you do and don't do. I mean, if you're talking to, you know, uh, a pretty girl or something, you don't start picking in your nose. You know, it would, it's just... You don't do that, you know. So, but when you are before the Blessed Sacrament, you do genuflect, you do bow, you do those acts of reverence. You don't talk. That's a big thing. To be in the presence of God, silence. That's a sign of adoration. It's a sign of worship. And I think that's something that we all, we really need to recapture in our churches is a sense of reverence. Which is, I think, the biggest division in the church right now is over that. We just need to have reverence. If we believe that God is present, how would we behave? If Jesus walked in right now, how would you behave? Uh, it would be a little bit different, right? Uh, there would be a certain amount of reverence that we would have to have. And so the same is true when we're adoring the Eucharist. Um, I don't have daughters. But I have had the privilege of being a spiritual mother to some young girls. And what I struggle with, because it distracts me, is when beautiful young girls are standing in front of me with, like, really short skirts or really short shorts or just dressed immodestly. And they're beautiful girls, 
and they're at church. So I'm like, thank you, Jesus, they're at church. But I'm, I'm distracted. So I'm thinking, okay, you know, I was a labor and delivery nurse. I know what the female body looks like. I, I'm, it, nothing scandalous to me in that regard. But, like, it's distracting. And so I think to myself, well, I guess my sons are probably distracted, and I guess everybody else behind me is distracted. And so I just I try to encourage young mothers and who want to be the cool mom or friends with their, their daughters, look, that's great Monday through Saturday, but on Sunday maybe we could just try to dress a little bit more modestly. So that's definitely something that helps us adore is to be properly dressed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Father White said this a long time ago. Um, he said we should give our best. Uh, he said we shouldn't just be dressed um, like average. We should be dressed in our best, not fancy, expensive best, just our best presentation. The Sunday best. Our that's Sunday that's best. So, so dress um, – yeah, Let's and, and and I also wanted to mention, well, you know, a couple of things. This is just, I mean, I I have two little sisters, but m modesty, modest modest girls get good guys. That's right. I mean, <laughs> immodest girls are gonna get not so good guys. So just always something to keep in mind. But I also wanted to say too how to receive the Eucharist because this is a big thing for me. Um, now, I'm just going to say, practically speaking, so, like, I went to the nursing home today. Ooh, it, I, I mean, I love, love the people, but it is dangerous business bringing the Eucharist to the nursing home because you never know if somebody's lucid or, and they all do all sorts of things. But one thing for me that's always, it's just easier because even though I'm receiving Jesus and I may want to receive him in my pew or I may want to receive him facing the altar, whatever, you're supposed to receive him immediately. And the reason why is because there's, there's danger of particles of Jesus because every particle is him being left somewhere. There's the danger. There are people, there are bad people in this world who do take the Eucharist and do bad things with it. It's very true. And so if you don't want to stress us priests out, receive immediately. So that, that's one reason why, that's the main reason why I like distributing communion on the tongue. Definitely not sanitary. I've, 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 I will tell you, I have touched many people's tongues and then touched another person's tongue. Not intentionally, but it happens. But, but just to tell you that it is, it's at least very, it's reverent and it is immediate. I, I know where the Eucharist is going. It gives me a peace of mind. But then also, if you do choose to receive on the hand, which is totally leg legitimate, I'm going to put down the mic for a second. Oh, you know, like this, and then you take the Eucharist directly to him. <laughs> um, not. <laughs> or, or one of my favorites, this is very confusing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't know what to do. <laughs> and they, there, there was one more that was uh, they said uh, they called the coin slot. <laughs> Not giving me much room to work with. But, but I, I think that. You know, the way, the way I approach it, it's just simple. You know, you put your one hand on top of the other. You use the bottom hand to take the Eucharist and put the Eucharist in your mouth. It, to me, that's just the, and you do it immediately. I've seen many people do it very well and very correctly, but I've also seen these others. And so I think it's just uh, very helpful when we receive him reverently. And it, and it helps me to be prayerful while I'm distributing communion, communion as well. So, Father... On a more serious note, um, does receiving the Eucharist remit venial sin? Yes. Okay. <laughs> and tell us, so, and, and so for these people who have left the church, maybe they're still part of the church, but maybe COVID scared them, or maybe they have health issues, or maybe they just, it's become more convenient to not come back. Right. Um, or maybe they just really don't believe 
or understand the value of receiving Jesus every week. I mean, it's so important. Yeah. Like, I know I need it. So, like, tell us about just the, the graces that come with receiving. Like, what can we expect yeah. when we receive Jesus? And we've prepared. So, not just the pre- preparation before, but, like, the preparation, like, as we're coming up and the prayers and all that. Yeah. So, I just want to tell this as a little story, story to prime the pump, kind of. There was one time where, where I was uh, visiting with someone who was dying. And this person's bed was in the middle of the house. And this person was clearly dying. I mean, it was kind of like the death rattle dying. It was a younger person, too. I mean, not young, but too young to be dying. And then the, the family was all gathered there. There's lots of people there. And no one, no one was next to the dying person. And I just thought, like, not even his, his mother. Um, and I was just like, is no one going to acknowledge him? So I went and I, I held his hand and I prayed the Divine Mercy Chaplet. And he looked at me, and certainly there are times where, I mean, I knew he couldn't speak, but he, his look told me, thank you. For, for doing this. And I just thought to myself, you know, how often do we treat Jesus, Jesus' presence the same way? Where we're all there gathered and totally ignoring him. Totally ignoring his presence. But the power of presence. And that's why we go to Mass. You know, um, I'm going to use... Emily and Drew, and my little sister and her, her boyfriend, they've been dating and they've, they've had long-distance relationship. Well, there's only so much that they want to see each other on the phone before they want to see each other in reality and be present to one another. Because when you love somebody, that's, that is always the case. And that's why we go to Mass. That's why, that's why EWTN Mass doesn't cut it. It just doesn't cut it. Now, I'm not it's a great alternative if that's all we have. But our presence is it, it's inexpressible. I mean, you you this is just part of being human and we can never lose the the importance of being present at mass. Now, even if I'm not in a state of grace, which if I'm not in a state of grace, in other words, if I've committed a grave sin, fully intending to do it, like I knew it was bad and I did it anyway, then I'm not in a state of grace. Which is, you know, it's not good. If you don't go to confession, that you do go to hell. That's, that's church doctrine. If you don't repent of that sin, you won't go to heaven. Now, repenting of that sin is in the sacrament of confession. Not, I know it's not easy to do, but it's very simple. We just go to the sacrament of confession and we can receive forgiveness for our sins. Then we can return to receiving the sacrament of the Eucharist. I think this is so important because, I, I mean, I can't tell you how many times people come to confession and they confess that they haven't been to Mass or whatever. And then, and then I always have to ask them, have you been receiving communion? And usually the answer is yes. So we have to know that... I, and this, Pope Francis says, the Eucharist is not a prize for the perfect. It's not, this is not our prize. This is, this is sheer gift. We don't deserve the Eucharist. Now, if I can't go to confession, I should still go to Mass and just not receive because I'm present and then makes a difference. makes a difference to me. It's probably going to move you to go to confession. So that's the importance. You don't have to receive communion every time. We do have to go to Mass every Sunday. But we ought to be in a state of grace. Well, we must be in a state of grace. Now, I had a kid ask me one time, well, what happens if you're not? Like, what happens? Well, your heart hardens. It makes it very hard to receive grace after that. That's why St. Paul advises against it. Because if I'm receiving the Eucharist without a heart that's able to receive grace, my heart gets hard. And you saw what happened to Pharaoh when his heart got hard. Eventually he became a monster. 
And that's why Jesus doesn't want us to do that. So the sacrament of confession softens our heart, allows us to receive the grace, so that when we receive the Eucharist, we can receive Christ. And so that's the importance of being present at Mass, but, uh, and, and, and then being in a state of grace whenever we receive him. Thank you, Father. Okay, so I do have more questions, but I have to get to this one because this is part of something the CJC does very often, and that is the fête de détest. And um, it's, a, it's a Eucharistic procession. And when we talk about adoring the Eucharist, a Eucharistic procession is an amazing way to do that in a public setting where you are a witness walking behind Jesus. Um, and it's, it's just such a magnificent um, experience. And so talk to us about what is a Eucharistic procession, why should we do it, what does it mean to you? And tell us a little bit about the pet. Yeah, so it, 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 it's very deeply significant to me because, well, I, I went to CJC. The first time I went to CJC was for a Corpus Christi procession. It was for a Eucharistic procession. And that was when I decided, that's when I knew. And then the following year on Corpus Christi, I entered with the community. And then... That, it was just a couple months after that where the inspiration came for Fed Dietetesh, which is the Eucharist, per, Eucharistic procession by boat. And be looking forward to 2024, Fed Dieu de Mississippi. <laughs> Tri- no, I'm being serious. We're going down the Mississippi River. So, But what that what we do for that procession, I mean, it's just that. We, we process and it's meant to be a public display of our faith. Because again, it, it, God's, that's one way that God is glorified when, when he is manifest in the world. God is, his glory breaks into this world. And evil is cast out. The light shines. The darkness cannot overcome it. And so whenever we manifest our faith Publicly, it, it changes things. It changes our environment. It changes the world. It changes us. And I can honestly say that every FET that I've done, there's been a significant change. Nearly every time, we have at least one person who decides to, to join the community for the FET, you know, who decides to give their life to Christ, um, that, I mean, there's just there. I can go through. There's innumerable stories um, of of just graces. But I've had the privilege. I, I think every year so far, I've been on the boat with the Eucharist. So I tell you what, it's pretty cool because it's like being one of the apostles who are you know on boats with Jesus, you know. And uh, one year, one year we were about to go under a bridge, and it was and we we're gonna hit the canopy. So. The driver put it in reverse, and we were all at the front, and it just went underwater. And, uh, and then the deacon had the Eucharist in his hands, and he stood up, and he hit his head on the monstrance, and he started bleeding. It was the most dramatic event. Uh, and we were like, Jesus, save us, you know? And he's, you have little faith, you know? No, but, uh, but we've got some stories. It's been, it's been a an incredible event, but predominantly, I mean, I, miracles happen. And uh, just a quick one, because I, I, I see Miss Chris has got the mic, uh, but a quick one is, is there was a girl who was suffering with some, some serious mental illness that we were close to in the community. And uh, my, my family one time for Christmas made me some peanut butter balls, and she came over to the community, and all she did was eat our peanut butter balls and sit in the adoration chapel. I mean, day and night. And then she was healed completely. Then she had another incident that happened, and then she got back in the hospital. We were praying for her for the Fed. She was, I think it's catatonic, is that the right word? Like non responsive at all. On the Fed, the day of the Fed, she came out of it completely. 
I mean, but that's just one of the miracles that we've had from the Fet. That's what happens when uh, there's a real manifestation of faith. Let's trade. I'm going to get up and walk around and give people an opportunity to ask you some questions. Um, are there any questions? Yes, okay, I see some. Where'd that hand come from? So, Father, um, so, Father, is there a, uh, it, 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 the history of the church mm -hmm. consecrating the Eucharist? Do, is that in the, I'm, I'm going to try to say this right, the Didache? Yeah, yeah, is there's, in there? there's a, there's a, some semblance of that in the, it's called the Didache, which uh, means the teaching talking about the teaching of the apostles. That was a later writing. That was, ac that was later than even Ignatius of Antioch. I mean, still very, very early. But, it, I mean, it's very clear the unbroken celebration of the Eucharist that happened until 2020. No, I'm just kidding. But, uh, no, but in all seriousness, the unbroken celebration of the Eucharist that happened since Jesus' institution. Now, was it, you know, how often was it? And I mean, it was clearly the Lord's Day. They certainly came together. But it was, it was also a community event. I mean, it was, and, and it, the day revolved around it. It wasn't the other way around. And, and, you know, that's something we need to recapture. I mean, I, I know the convenience of the Vigil Mass is something that is certainly convenient. But our Sunday doesn't revolve around the Mass whenever we're getting it out the way on the Saturday. So, you know, these are just things to consider. How are we going to, how are we going to, how are we going to actually have a Eucharistic revival? Well, we're going to have to really reinvigorate, reignite the devotion that we have to the Eucharist. And that's something that we as priests need to lead, but you as the people need to really take on. And, and, and show and manifest that faith. Bring people to the Eucharist. There's nobody who's going to have more of an opportunity to bring someone to the Eucharist than you. Because you work with them. You live with them. You may be married to them. You know, that, that, that you can bring others to the Eucharist. Okay. Um, <clears throat> speaking of what we have, you know, just recently here, um, would you say that embracing Eucharistic processions like the, the church used to would be a great benefit and great fruit of the of a Eucharistic revival? Yes, yeah. Uh, as many public displays of faith that we can have, the more revival we're going to have. Now this this word revival, that's a that's a Protestant term. You know, that was from that was from, you know, uh 19th uh 20th centuries that you had these 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 Protestant revivals, these big tent revivals, but and it's sort of an uncaris, car, uncontrollably charismatic event. But the bishops are mandating that we have that in the church. This is a kind of an unprecedented time, where the 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 bishops are really not only giving us permission but asking us to have an enthusiasm toward the Eucharist that the world has never seen before. That's what the bishops, bishops are really asking us to do. And it's, it really, I think COVID, we can look at COVID in a, a few ways, certainly as a purgation, certainly as a, a punishment. We can look at it in all those ways. But maybe it was a pre preparation for this Eucharistic revival. Because don't, don't you always appreciate more what you've lost? And then we appreciate the Eucharist more, hopefully, when we couldn't have it. Yes. Um, you were mentioning receiving communion on the tongue and versus a hand, and both of them being quite unsanitary, because the hand is no better than the mouth. Right. But do you, I see young people, a lot of the um, high school students and college students, that they kneel and receive the Eucharist by the tongue. And I think that shows so much reverence. And I think maybe we should promote that more with, like, First Communion, 
having the children learn to receive it on the tongue instead of in the hand? Do you agree with that? I certainly, I mean, it, it's, I, it is very much a powerful witness, especially seeing young people do that. You know, I mean, I, and I know it, it is a, it's a sort of a contentious issue, and I, I'm, I mean, I'll plead the fifth a little bit, but I d- also want to say, though, that, like, those public displays of faith, now, and, and, and so, I guess what I'm saying is, is that there can, there can be other public displays of faith, but certainly kneeling is a, is a clear act of reverence. I mean, it always has been. That's what people, you know, uh, throughout the scriptures, what they do when they meet Jesus. They bow down to him, they kneel to him, they do him homage, and then they ask for what they want. Um, and so it certainly does seem to be a very clear sign of reverence. And I, I, I think as much as we can teach that reverence to young people, do it, have those real signs of reverence in our own lives, we're going to see more of a Eucharistic revival because it's just it we it will convince us that we believe, and I mean I just have to say this you know like I mean this seems sounds a little bit insignificant or unrelated but I remember in high school when I decided to stop stop saying bad words, it changed my whole thought process, it changed the way I felt, it changed the way I, I perceive things, it changed my life something as simple as that. So we are, because we're incarnate creatures, what we do in the flesh matters. How we show signs of reverence, how we do this. So, so I mean, yeah, it's, as much as we can revive reverence, we're reviving the Eucharist. The last thing I'll close with is um, a lot of people stop me and ask me, why do you veil? And that's where veiling comes from. It's just an outward sign of an interior disposition. It's just one more way to humble myself and to be more focused in prayer and to show reverence. It's not a club. It's not um, prescribed. Um, it's not mandatory. It's just a, it's just a devotion. Mm-hmm. So um, it's, it's one more way. And, and there's so much more we could have talked about tonight, so many things. Um, I will tell you that many years ago, and I've, sa- I've said this um, to this group before, um, or at, at one of these events, many years ago I was going through a really rough time. Um, and I went and saw Father Champagne, and he said, um, I have the prescription for healing. You see that adoration chapel right there? He said, I need, a, I need a spot filled from 2 to 3 p.m. on Tuesdays, and that was back October of 2013. And, and I signed up, and, and I went until, we, until y'all closed the chapel and moved it, and then adoration opened here. And what I tell people when they come to me and say, you know, I know you've endured a lot of loss. I know um, I'm seeking your advice. I say, do you go to adoration? And, and when they say no, I say, okay, I have the perfect prescription for you. All you have to do, I'll give you the code, and you just go to adoration because Jesus will change you. But he won't change you, in my opinion, if you just check in once in a while. He wants our whole heart, our whole mind, our whole soul. And um, we're not perfect, um, and those of us who go regularly, we're, we're definitely the least perfect. Um, but we go because that's where our healing takes place, and that's where, um, that's where we're rejuvenated, and, and that's where all the good things happen. I want to thank you so much, Father John Joseph, for being with us tonight. I also would like to thank the Hands and Feet Committee who set up for us and will tear down. I'd like to thank the Ladies Altar Society and all the people who um, provided food for us tonight, as well as our AV crew, and of course, Father Michael and Father Casey for always um, providing us these opportunities to encounter Jesus and become missionary disciples. We have adoration to follow, so I encourage you all, if you would like to spend a little time with Jesus, he is waiting for you next door. Thank you so much, and have a great night. Amen.